are here in the presence of God. Jesus said if, that if we gather together in his name, he's there in the midst of us. He's with us right now. And for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, he's indwelling us. So how can you lose? How can you possibly lose if the Lord is with you and in you and upon you? Amen? God is so faithful. I just, I'm so grateful to him. How many of us have been rescued? How many of us were on the paths of ruin and destruction or confusion and self-defeat and our Lord got hold of us? Amen. And he transformed our lives. And we no longer think the way we thought. We no longer act the way we acted. And we no longer live the way we once lived. We live in this new life that Jesus has given us. And it's a wonderful life. And it's a life filled with hope and joy. This is a wonderful journey we're taking together in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? And it's forcefully advancing. It's not retreating. The world is retreating. The world is under the grip of the evil one. But we are liberated in Christ Jesus. It's for freedom that we were set free. And we are a free people to be all that God has called us to be at this very critical hour in history. Amen? I'm so blessed by how God is working in your lives, especially our young people. It is such a delight and a privilege to see young people who have a hunger for God, who want to do life in accordance with God's will for them. They don't want to make foolish decisions. They want to make right decisions. They want to honor God. They want to reveal God. They want to glorify God. They want to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. And that gives me hope for the future. So bless our young people. Engage them. Pray for them. Encourage them. And stand by them and support them. We're not here to judge one another. We're here to lift each other up and to bless one another. Amen. And to speak the truth and love over one another. And that's how we build up the body of Christ. That's how Jesus builds up his, his house, his temple. We just need to be faithful. What ought we to do in these last days? In 2 Timothy, Paul speaks to his spiritual son. There's such a bond here of love and warmth and affection and strength. Paul the Apostle poured into this young man and he became a champion of the faith. He ultimately was, was the shepherd over the church of Ephesus and he was martyred in that city. A great man of faith. This is what Paul says to Timothy in his second letter to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 2. He says to Timothy, preach the word. That's an imperative that was, that was a command. That wasn't a suggestion. Preach the word. And so we must also find a parallel between what he is speaking to Timothy and what the Lord is speaking and the Spirit is speaking to the church today. Preach the word. When there's chaos and mayhem and darkness and frustration and confusion, preach the word. Be prepared. Or as one translation says, be ready. The word there, be prepared or be ready, in the original language is a military term that commanded soldiers to remain at their posts no matter what. No matter what, they were to stand and remain right where they were planted as their commanding officer had determined. We are planted in Christ, in his will, in his word, in his purposes. And we will not be shaken. We will not swerve to the left or to the right. Where our heels are dug in the will of God and the word of God. Amen? So preach the word. Be prepared. In season or out of season. And so what's interesting, in season in the Greek, eukaitis actually means when times are good, and out of season, akairos, which means when times are bad. He says, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful 
instruction. There's another translation that the Amplified renders. It says, herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency in these last days. Stand by, be at hand and ready, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable. You stand, whether the conditions are favorable or unfavorable in the world around you. It doesn't matter because God is living in you. The Spirit of God is living in you. It doesn't matter what happens out here. We guard our hearts and protect what's in here. Amen? So whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, we have to have a sense of urgency and stand. Stand at our posts and guard our hearts. Whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome, it may not be welcome. People may not welcome what we have to say, but we stand our ground and we are faithful and we will see the deliverance of the Lord and we will see the work of the Lord right before our very eyes. The scripture says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And I think that the Lord is actually working on the church right now to be quick to listen. Because Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And very often, especially if we're to minister to people, if God's calling to us to minister to people, we need to listen to them just with an open heart and an open mind and allow the Lord to bear witness to what we're hearing, to show us certain things that we need to know because our desire is to see them whole and restored and empowered and filled with the life of Jesus, fulfilling their divine purpose. And so we want to listen. We want to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And in America, we tend to talk a lot. We air our opinions, which is interesting because now we're, have, we're seeing the beginnings of a violation of our freedom of speech and censorship in our own country. So we spoke last week about words and how words can build up or tear down. Your words are so powerful. You know, we are called ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador actually speaks on behalf of the head of state. He speaks the words that have been given him. And we are ambassadors for Christ. So we speak the very words that God has entrusted to us. Amen? And so our words must be choice words. Words that align with God's will and God's word. Amen? Our words ought to be wholesome and uplifting and giving life. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. We can build up or we could destroy. And as we shared last week, we can create an atmosphere or an environment with our words. I've known people who grew up in an environment that was terribly destructive and negative, filled with negative words, words that brought self-doubt, a lack of self-confidence, hopelessness, despair, a lack of courage, timidity. I knew one man who grew up in such an environment, a tremendously gifted man, and he was like those, the Israelites that didn't take God at his word and they went into the promised land and they saw only giants. Joshua and Caleb saw opportunity. And this man coming from a negative environment, his parents were not born again believers and he had so, such a lack of self-confidence that he wouldn't make the most of every opportunity that was given him. And he saw himself not as the giant, as the person who could be successful at what he was about to embark on. He saw himself as a grasshopper. 
He saw all those who were competing with him as giants. They were big and he was little. And he missed opportunities. And so your words in your home can create an environment and an atmosphere of hope and faith, encouragement, courage and strength and humility. You can build this, friends. And God has given you the tools and God has given you the materials to build it. Amen? By the way, this fellow also became a procrastinator. He was so filled with fear and self-doubt that he actually became a procrastinator. And things he knew he had to do, he didn't do for fear and fear of failure. His environment actually was noxious. It was a toxic environment where there was no hope. He was self-defeated. He was already defeated before he started because he knew in his own heart that he couldn't succeed. And that was a self-inflicted wound that, that he carried for the rest of his life. So words can penetrate our hearts and minds. They determine our perceptions of ourselves and others. Words can shape our attitudes and actions as well as our language. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Listen to people. You'll hear what is in their hearts as you listen as they pour out words. This is why we must fill ourselves with the Word of God continuously each and every day. It's an antidote to the lies that the devil is speaking to all of us. It's the lies that we hear in the world around us being propagated each and every day, words that tear down, words that put fear and confusion and torment, words that drive people apart from one another and divide and create conflict and strife. You see, those are the words, and the words in our culture come from those who are unredeemed and those who speak lies and not the truth. And God's going to deal with them, friends. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they will come into a knowledge of the truth because God desires that, that all will come to repentance and come to a knowledge of the truth, which is the Lord Jesus is Lord of all and the Savior of the world. So words have built families, communities, nations, and empires, but words have also destroyed them. Patrick Henry, one of the great patriots, of our nation said, give me liberty or give me death. It inspired the colonists. And what's interesting is preceding the Declaration of Independence, there was a revival in America. And ironically, there was a British evangelist ministering here. Isn't that interesting? But there was a revival to revive the hearts of the people and to strengthen them. Because God knew he sent these people to, the, to America to bring forth a revival because God knew that he would birth a nation that would take the gospel to the four corners of the earth. Amazing, isn't it? So there are men who are Renaissance men, men who have been instruments of God. The other is Martin Luther King in his I Have a Dream speech. He touched the nation's heart. He did it through reason, not radicalism. He helped change this society by awakening what is righteous and what is true and what is right in God's eyes. And he did so by building up the nation and not tearing it down, destroying it. Thank God for these men that God uses, they are available vessels in the hands of God. President Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He was speaking of the Berlin Wall, and it came down. Do we have the boldness to declare? You see, we are declaring God's word. Will we have the boldness to declare God's word and see God's will accomplished? Winston Churchill was God's man in the necessary time for his people. 
It was when the Germans were rolling over Europe and dominating the European continent. He said, never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. He said, let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say this was their finest hour. Will he was concerned about the legacy that he will leave. Are future generations going to look at our generation right now and the challenges ahead of us and the, the, the dire transformations that are taking place in the world, will they look back to our generation and say, you know something? This was our finest hour. These people were people of faith. They stood faithful in the truth. They withstood cancellation, criticism, ostracism persecution for the sake of the truth of the gospel and for the sake of the truth being spoken to their nation and to their leaders. Some paid with their own lives. Some were tortured. Some were persecuted. Some were imprisoned. Will future generations look back at us and say we were exceptional? Will we be exceptional? You have the opportunity to be exceptional. Because we believe in American exceptionalism. And we can play a role in reshaping our country if we're faithful, humble, faithful, repentant before God. And we can make a difference in America. There are no hopeless causes or lost causes in the kingdom of heaven. And believe me, if the Lord would save Sodom for 10 people, how much more will he save America for millions and millions of faithful servants of God, born-again believers who are praying and interceding for this nation, fasting and praying? How much more? Amen? On the world stage, it often appears that evil wins out, but praise God, he is the ultimate judge and so good ultimately overcomes evil. That's the good news. Hitler was a demagogue. He was a demagogue and a genocidal psychopath. He ultimately destroyed his nation. His nation was vulnerable. They were broken by the First World War. They were living in poverty. Their nation was in ruins because of that loss of that terrible First War. And thank God that they lost that First War. But he exploited the vulnerabilities in his people. And he tried to instill a pride because the man was arrogant. He wasn't concerned about the good for his people. He was concerned about his own lust for power. Amen? We live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The words of God are our very lives. In the beginning the, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, before Jesus' incarnation, he was called God the Word. And the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So now Jesus is available to each and every person who will believe in him. And not only do we experience Jesus, not only do we participate in his salvation, but he indwells us. He takes up residence in our hearts and he leads and he guides us. He cares for us. He encourages us. He inspires us and he strengthens us. Isn't that good news? The greatest weapon in your spiritual arsenal is the word of God without question. When tempted by the evil one on the Mount of Temptation, Jesus responded and overcame the lies of the enemy by saying, it is written. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Word of God is living and active. The Amplified Version says, full of power, making it alive, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. You see, when I look into the Word, the Word is like a mirror. The Word looks into me. 
I see myself as I really am, and the word of God speaks to my heart. It convicts me. It shows me the things in my life that are of my fallen nature, my soul, the things that I need to ask God for forgiveness for. Amen? And so he divides, and it divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of my heart when I look into the Word of God, and that's a good thing. Nothing in all creation, it says, is hidden from God's sight. In other words, God is aware of all things. He's aware of the condition of my heart. And friends, today it, we're in a valley of decision. We can choose life or we can choose death. When we hear people talk about the bad things that are happening in the world or maybe even the bad things that are happening in our lives, we must understand what's the alternative. Are we going to serve God or are we going to serve the world and the evil one? It's a very simple choice. It's one way or the next. It's darkness or light. Choose this day whom you will serve because we will have to make a choice. And friends, if we are not holding on to the anchor of our souls, Jesus Christ, we will drift. And many, that's why Jesus said there will be a great falling away in the last days. Many will fall away from the faith in the last days. They will not seek God, they will not trust him, and they will embrace the world because the world has an allure that they desire more than God. Amen? Does that make sense? We shared last week about the Hebrew for word. The Hebrew word for word is dabar. And we shared that it's quite fascinating and interesting that in Hebrew thought, dabar, which means word, can also be translated thing, a substance. In Hebrew thinking, words are things, and they have just as much substance as any other thing has. In Hebrew, you cannot differentiate between a word and a thing or a noun. Words are concrete. Words are tangible. Words are real. Words are substantive. Words are enduring. God's word endures forever. Forever. Nothing will get in the way of his word, will stop his word from going forth and being fulfilled. Nothing. We've seen prophecies written ten th many thousands of years ago, and even today we're seeing these prophecies being fulfilled in our very lifetime. Isn't that amazing? So words can build up or they can tear down. They can bring restoration, recovery, or ruin. Words are like building materials. Just as we would build a physical shelter for our family by constructing a house out of brick, concrete, steel, or wood, the quality of our words can be likened to either brick or bamboo. Would you build a house out of brick or bamboo? What would you prefer, especially in a storm? I think I'd want brick, wouldn't you? When you build According to the word of God, it's likened to a brick structure, a solid structure built on a solid foundation, on the rock of our salvation, Jesus Christ. What's interesting, we can build with brick or bamboo, we can build with concrete or cob. Interestingly, in Wales, there's this building material that is native, and it's called cob. And it's pretty much clay soil with aggregate and with some fibrous organic material, usually straw. And they mix that together with water. And it's like a mud. And they fashion and they shape it and they construct walls with it. Now, some of them are very pretty, but would you want a cob house in Florida during hurricane season? I don't think so. We want to build on a sure foundation with the materials that God has given us because then 
we will stand in the face of storms, the storms of life. And so interestingly, we can also build a structure that is a spiritual structure for our families that provides a safe and secure place from any intrusions of evil. We must also construct a spiritual dwelling or an ark of safety for our families, protecting us from the demonic storms or any attacks or invasions of the devil. The, material we, the materials we use to build this important protective ark or structure is the truth of God's word and his promises, his love, his faithfulness, his guidance, his joy, his peace, and his wisdom and power. The fruit of the Holy Spirit produced in our lives also serves as necessary materials in order to build a dwelling place for our families, a place that is filled with the Lord's presence. Amen? You can do that. In fact, we have a responsibility to do it as parents. In view of this, we must use our words carefully, precisely, and sparingly. Words have power. And if you are a child of God, your words change not only the environment in which you live, but your words have the capacity to see change in people's lives, to see their attitudes shift, to see their hearts open. Do you know that words, the word of God spoken through you in love, in humility, in grace, can actually open the hearts of people who have been hard-hearted toward God. Do you know that? It's amazing. Love never fails. God's love never fails. Amen? So God's words, they create. God's words actually connect the spiritual realm with the material realm. Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. And so God connects these two realms through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And that's why we see miracles taking place. That's why we see broken bodies restored. That's why we see broken relationships being restored. That's why we see broken hearts being restored. We see broken families and broken marriages being restored because of God's power, the power of his word. And I can't tell you, there's nothing more powerful than knowing that you are an instrument in God's hands and he's speaking through you. He's loving other people through you. He's encouraging and affirming other people and inspiring other people through you. You have become an instrument in the very hands of God. And when you purpose to be an instrument of God, you are then in the master's hands. Amen? Isn't this awesome? Praise God. God is faithful. A man's, and this is Proverbs 18, as I finish up here in a couple of minutes, a man's moral self, the Amplified says, his moral self shall be filled with the fruit of his mouth and with the consequence of his words, he must be satisfied, whether good or evil. And so my mor the moral content of my life is transformed by the fruit of my mouth. It also bears witness to the condition of my heart. And I must bear the consequences of the condition of my heart and what comes out of my mouth. Death and life, Solomon says, are in the power of the tongue, and they who indulge, it, indulge in it shall eat its fruit, either death or life. We can choose death or we can choose life. There's no middle ground, friends, and I can't impress more firmly the fact that this is a valley of decision. This day we must choose whom we will serve.
Kind words, Solomon says in Proverbs 16, are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. Do you know you can share the word of God to others in love and you can see God bringing healing to that physical body, healing to that soul, healing to that per person's life just because you are faithful. Job 5 says you will be protected from the lash of the tongue and need not fear when destruction comes. Remember that scripture today. We will be protected from the lash of the tongue and need not fear when destruction comes. Some of you have gone through some very hard times these last few years. God is preparing you for what's ahead of you and you are equipped. You may have taken some, taken some hits personally but God is with you and he is for you and he's preparing you. He first prepares you and then he positions you and then he empowers you to do his will. Yes. Amen? Are you ready? Are you ready? These are the last days. In fact, when Paul was talking about the last days, the picture, last days, was the last port of call for a ship. There's no place to go after that. It's the end of the end of the end. And these are the last days right now. We're in the end of the end of the end of the last days. And you're witnessing it. And if that can't get you excited, I don't know what will. Amen? In Romans chapter 10, the word is near you, Paul says. It is in your mouth and in your heart that is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You have eternal life. When your time on this earth is ended, you will step out of this physical body and step into the presence of Jesus, fully conscious, fully aware, fully intact. And you will no longer be encumbered by the limitations of this physical body, by the pain and the aging and the struggles, the spiritual struggles and emotional struggles of this physical body and these worldly, fleshly emotions. You will be liberated. And that's the promise that Jesus has. But what is even more important to us right now as we live in this world is that Jesus will indwell us and lead us and guide us. Tell us what is yet to come and teach us and show himself to us. Amen. So the word of God is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. It's the word of faith we are proclaiming. So we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. End of story. Nothing else is required. We are saved by the grace of God, Paul tells us, through faith in Jesus Christ alone. There's nothing I have to do. He's done it all on the cross. Jesus confirmed it by saying, just before he drew his last breath, he said, it is finished. It means... It was a banking term. It can mean paid in full. Full provision was made for our redemption. We are no longer captives to sin, to death, and to Satan. We are free men. Let's live as free men. You are unbound. Go forth in the faith, in the power, in the love, in the hope with great expectation in the purposes of Jesus. You have a life to live, friends. This is not a time to hide. This is a time to move forward. Amen? So we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. Why? Because in our hearts we believe that God raised him from the dead. For it is with your heart that you believe, Paul says, and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Isn't it wonderful that you can know why God put you on this earth? You can only know what your future is if you go to the one who created you.
Amen. This season is a season where we're going to learn to trust God as never, ever, ever before. I know I've said that many times. There's an interesting illustration. There was a tribe. And this tribe, it may have been, I think, in, um, in New Guinea. A father takes his son into the forest. <clears throat> there was a rite of passage for boys to become men. And he leaves the boy alone in the forest, in the jungle. He instructs his son that he is to sit on a stump the entire night and not move an inch. He is to remain blindfolded throughout this whole test until the rays of the early morning sun will begin to shine through his blindfold. He is not permitted to cry out for help from anyone. Once he survives this test, this boy is now considered a man. The boy was naturally terrified, as the report discloses. He can hear all sorts of sounds and noises in the deep dark of night. Wild beasts are in the jungles. And this young man, no doubt, had fear that he would be prey to these predators. Maybe even another human being might do harm to him. It could be a forbidding and a frightening place to be all alone in the jungle or in a forest with no one around and no help whatsoever. The winds would blow. And it's interesting how the winds blowing through the leaves can have this menacing kind of sound sometimes when they whip up very, very aggressively. And so here he is, sitting on this stump, blindfolded. His imagination must have gone wild with all these convoluted thoughts of potential harm. He probably thought that he would easily be a victim. The sun emerges, and the sun's rays peer through the blindfold, and this young man removes his blindfold. And he discovered, looking to his side, that his father was with him every moment of the night, and he didn't even know it. Friends, some of you are in a dark place. Some of you are in a frightening place. You may have gotten a frightening report. You may be in a desperate and dark place. But I want you to know that your Heavenly Father will never leave you nor forsake you. He will always be there to protect you, to guard you, to guide you, to embrace you, to love you, to affirm you, to encourage you, and to exhort you. Are you getting this? This young man now is a man. He's accepted by the community as a man. Why? Because, number one, he learned to take instruction. He was disciplined. He took his father at his father's word and did not deviate. He was a young man who now showed that he can be entrusted and trustworthy. Do you see that? And being so, he was now the material, the raw material for a future husband and father. He had proven himself to his father, to other men, and to the whole tribe. He was obedient. 
He submitted to authority. That makes a man. That's a difference between the boys and the men. The men submit to authority and they respect authority. Amen? They are courageous. They are dependable. And we need men such as this today. Amen? So into the lives of young men that want to know Jesus and to fulfill his purposes for their lives. If the heart's open and the arms are open, embrace them, pray for them, teach them. If they're serious, they'll come to you. You don't have to seek them out. And pour yourself into them like Paul poured himself into Timothy, his spiritual son. You pour and you pour and you pour. And you know what's wonderful? You're pouring with God's resources. You've, you empty, God fills you. And you can do this till you draw your last breath. You can pour into the lives of other people. Why? Because God's heavenly resources and treasures are inexhaustible. We have people, especially young people, in this church, in our communities, and in America. And we need to start pouring into them. Because especially if our young men do not become men of character, men of strength and courage and dependability, we will not have strong families. And we're, all, we're also experiencing the effect of the corrosion of the nuclear family in America. We are raising kids without fathers or father figures. And it's heartbreaking to see what it's doing to them and what it's doing to our culture. I know this is a challenge to men in this church. Be a spiritual father. If you're not an older season believer, you can be a spiritual brother and you can help people your own age stay on track. Hold each other accountable in the love of Christ.